stays rigged against America. Syrian refugees flood in. Illegal immigrants convicted of committing crimes get to stay, collecting Social Security benefits, skipping the line. Our border open, it's more of the same, but worse. Donald Trump's America is secure. Terrorist and dangerous criminals kept out. The border secure, our families safe. Change that makes America safe again. Donald Trump for president. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. Let's watch this again, because it's fun. Pay attention. Are there any metaphors in there? Visual and or verbal? Verbal and or visual. In Hillary Clinton's America, the system stays rigged against Americans. Syrian refugees flood in. Illegal immigrants convicted of committing crimes get to stay. Collecting Social Security benefits, skipping the line. Our border open, it's more of the same, but worse. Donald Trump's America is secure. Terrorist and dangerous criminals kept out. The border secure, our families safe. Change that makes America safe again. Donald Trump for president. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. You know, there's lots of stuff going on in here. Um, I mean, obviously, it starts with piano, looming music. Look how she's sort of in the shadows, in the dark. Evil. Crooked. Um... America, Still, all this is sort of Americans. black and Syrian it's hard to see. Flooded. Oop, that was a good one. Refugees flood in. Syrian refugees flood in. Water, water. And what does flood imply? Lots of things. This, the, this destruction of the world. Noah. We need an ark. Look, it's still blurry, but that the flood is actually the biggest uh, metaphor uh, that I found in here as I sort of watched this a couple of times, at least verbally. Illegal immigrants convicted of committing crimes get to stay, collecting Social Security benefits, skipping the line. Our border open, it's more of this. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I'm sure this is, I don't know where this is from, um, but there is a sort of a visual metaphor here about getting on the train, I guess. But this ain't no peace train. And again, it's hard to see. It's sort of dark and, and, and grimy and grainy. Same, but worse. Watch this. That was Clinton. Now, ooh, you can already see the light and the helicopter. I guess a lot of the, the military stuff could be visual metaphors for strength and power. I don't know. Donald Trump's America. And the is music is awesome. Secure. Terrorist and dangerous criminals kept out. The border secure. Our families safe. Change that makes America safe again. Donald Trump for president. I'm Don Ends with a battleship. And Donald Trump, and I approve this message. Yeah. Hillary Clinton's America. Okay. The enough, enough. So, I mean, you see these juxtapositions, but, I mean, the major metaphor there is flood. What does that mean? Um, I mean, you could write a paper on just that word, and, and I don't know how many times uh, Trump has sort of used that, or the Trump campaign has used that as a metaphor for... Uh, refugees, um, but the idea of flood uh, as something that is destructive and, and horrible, uh, that's going to destroy something, uh, that is uh, probably, Burke would say, a good inroads into understanding the worldview of Trump and the Trump campaign, and also uh, offering for the readers or the audience a certain way of looking, particularly at that uh, Syrian immigration uh, situation, apart from all the Skittle stuff. Um, so it's really interesting, but then you, we also see the visuals, particularly the light and the dark, and how oftentimes uh, all politicians do this. You will portray uh, your opponent as, as dark, scary, uh, and you as light, yay, go team, upbeat music, so what I'm asking you to do, I mean, so, so for a couple of different things. First, uh, three, okay. As a, uh, a student of political communication, one of the things that you're doing is paying attention to the metaphors that are used in political discourse and what might, uh, the use of those uh, particular metaphors, what, what sort of vision uh, or of reality um, is it offering? And what kind of uh, underlying 
uh, ideology or a motive uh, might be you know, propelling that particular vision of reality and, and how does it invite the audience to sort of see the world this way but not this way over here. As a practitioner, uh, obviously, I mean, you want to think about using powerful metaphors and archetypal metaphors in a strategic way to help your audience see the world the way that you want them to see it. Um, and then, uh, as a, as if you're writing your paper um, and, and you want to use this particular concept, metaphor, as your, um, as your critical lens, I mean, you're picking a text that you think has a lot of, of uh, important metaphors in there, maybe borrowing some of the ideas, not only from Han, but some of the extra stuff that I put on here from Osborne. Um, to, uh, to, in a sense, analyze and, 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 and figure out, you know, what are all the metaphors that are being used in a particular uh, uh, political communication text and what are the consequences of all those uh, metaphors using the whole diet framework. Okay, so that's the metaphor stuff. Um, System stays ah. with Americans. Syrian refugees flood in. Illegal immigrants convicted of committing Enough. crimes get to... Okay. Um, now, let me get to the mythic stuff. It's a mythic PowerPoint. I love the picture of Stanford, so I thought it was pretty good. I found it. I thought it was funny. Okay, so let's start. I'm, I'm talking about this a little bit differently than the way Han uh, did. Um, sort of, kind of. But let's start with this idea of values. Because I think when it comes to issues of myth, we're thinking about these larger ideas of values, but also worldview, same stuff with metaphor, really. Or myth, same stuff with metaphor. So, values generally are deep-seated, persistent beliefs about essential rights and wrongs that expresses our basic orientation to life. What do we value as a conservative? What do we value as a liberal? What do we value as an American? What do we value as a not American? What do you value? I don't know. Can you think of any big values? What do we value? Value money. We value education. We value honesty. We value individualism. We value true value. We value whatever. All these different things. So, whatever. Now, where do a lot of values come from? Myths. Now, the first thing you're going to think about when you think about myth is that it is a falsehood or a lie. It's just a myth. That's not sort of the way we're thinking about myth here. Uh, we're thinking uh, as a myth as a cultural story, and it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It creates or helps create our sense of, of our values and our, our worldview. So myths generally are master stories describing exceptional people doing exceptional things and serving as moral guides to proper action. That is sort of the traditional sense of what a myth is. Um, and again, they don't have to be literal or accurate. Uh, we're not really concerned with this. And myths, Rod Hart, this is all, a lot of this stuff from Rod Hart at the University of Texas. Um, my, my, myths are the substance of culture. Right? So, for instance, examples. What is the, the biggest sort of, even though we've got Edelman and Edelman and, and What's his name? Parentian print print. Ah. Um, America. America. The self-made American. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Rags to riches. In America, you can do anything. Whew. Particularly when you're born into a very wealthy family. If you're born into poverty... Mm, maybe. We'll see. Um, but, I mean, there's lots of different uh, sort of social, well, there's lots of different types of myths. Um, there are, uh, well, there's, there's uh, the cosmological myths, stories of the existence of why are we here, where did we come from. I came from outer space. You ancient alien asylum alien. Let's 
so we also have societal myths teach us so-called proper ways to behave uh, identity Washington can tell why we have uh, identity myths blah 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 all this type of stuff um, so there's different types of, of myths and I think the ones that we're particularly interested in are uh, societal myths identity myths Remember the old melting pot? That's another sort of American uh, myth. Uh, the melting pot. This idea that we all come in and we're stew. I like stew. Today's the first day of fall. Stew is like fall weather. It's a melting pot. Have you ever been to the melting pot? Um, with the, the fondue place? I don't like it. I don't know. I just don't. I'm not a big fondue person. I don't want to. I guess it would be, it's like fun at a party or something like that, but I don't want to go out and have to fix my own food. That's why I hate it from home, so I can go out and bring it home. <laughs> In any case, um, okay. So, um, Holland's taking a slightly different sort of route, um, I suppose, and he borrows from uh, Edelman. And here are uh, some of the, uh, the myths or the stories that he says are, are predominant um, within uh, our society. Uh, All problems are caused by outgroups. Those damn immigrants. Those. Like if you're in Casey. All they do is spread their okra. Our leaders, our leaders are benevolent heroes who will lead us out of danger. Depends on the leader. The function of the citizen is to sacrifice or work hard to do the bidding of the leaders. I don't know all this. This is what Edelman says. Uh, da, da, da. He goes into all this stuff and he offers examples. I think the key. Uh, is sort of maybe in the middle of page 124 here. The citizen, says psychologist E. Frohm, uh, sees in the rulers the powerful ones, the strong and the wise, persons to be revered. Citizens believe the rulers wish them well. They also know the resistance to those in power always is punished. So they are content uh, when by docility they can win praise from these more superior persons. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I mean, quite, and particularly in politics, politics, we think they're all bozos. Um, but, um, you know, here, the very last thing uh, is pretty interesting um, when he, uh, when Han sort of is summarizing all this stuff. Um, so where are we? I don't know. Where are you, Han? We have examined the nature of metaphors and found that through them we express what we, what we were not aware we were saying. Metaphors provide arguments through the principle of terministic per perfection. Yeah, yeah. They reveal our individual thought patterns, blah, blah. Collectively, they reveal societal thought patterns. I already said that. And societal thought patterns are myths, some of which we have discussed. But the myths we have examined concerning where problems are thought to come from, whether the president is a benevolent leader and the role of the citizen, are not the kind we meet every day in our political arguments. It is those everyday myths, I assume that we should be most aware of, for they are the ones we are most likely to encounter in our daily lives, okay? Or even to use in our own argumentation. Therefore, let us turn our attention to a series of axioms that political science Michael Peretti, Peretti, Peretti has identified as so common in our political rhetoric that they might well be considered myths by now. And so he has some stuff that's all about citizens being disengaged. You can't fight City Hall. Our leaders know best. You cannot legislate morality, but we try. The more things change, the more they remain the same. It doesn't make any difference whom we elect. They're all the same. Hmm. And then he has this sort of, uh, you know, he, he, he brings